so the right is rising in Eastern Europe, and you have Russia and Ukraine, and 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 all this shit happening right now um, over oil and pipelines. But fundamentally, and a hundred thousand troops on a border, you know, within a hundred kilometers of Kiev. It's I, I, I'm actually sort of what you do in Germany. I don't know why people aren't talking about it on the streets. Like that's a train ride from here. You know, how far? Mm. Uh, just across Poland. So you know, probably twelve hours. Wow. <laughs> so I mean, this this leads. Actually, let's listen about um, the tension in Ukraine right now. Ukrainians are welcoming 2022 by preparing for a possible Russian invasion, digging new trenches by hand in the frozen earth. Lined by minefields, the trenches already stretch for miles across eastern Ukraine. Crude defenses that have changed little since World War I. Maxim, a Ukrainian soldier, says he'll fight to the end. But of the talks, he adds, my opinion is wars have always been resolved through diplomacy. We expect that our leaders will solve these issues. Maria, a forward scout, didn't see her four-year-old son for Christmas and may not for many months to come. Hopefully, on the other side, they love their families just like we do and don't want to see bloodshed and death, she says. Russia has also moved in missile launchers and this huge clearing vehicle that can cut a path through forests for columns of tanks. On Sunday, Secretary of State Blinken said he doesn't expect any breakthroughs ahead of key talks between the U.S. and Russia. If Russia commits renewed aggression against uh, Ukraine, uh, I think it's a very fair prospect that NATO will reinforce its positions along its, its eastern flank. To de-escalate and convince Russia to pull back, the United States is willing to make concessions. U.S. officials say they're willing to discuss scaling back military exercises near Russia if Russia reciprocates with its military drills. Not deploying offensive missiles in Ukraine and broader missile control agreements across Europe. So um, this is, you know, it's, it's, it's alarming. Uh, and, and looping in with our previous conversation about just the far the, the right rising up simultaneously. So when you have the right rising up and the center left or you know more establishment left that's been in control in, in many of the Western democracies and liberal democracies around the world, really weak right now and and holding the the far left, the worker left uh, down, are we in a place where, I mean, is this as alarming as it seems from the U.S. fundamentally in numbers? It's or is more it alarming than letters? anyone's even willing to admit. It's more alarming than anyone's even to admit because it is so messy and the absence of anything has led to vacuums uh, on both sides where like, I mean, you're talking about far right. We've allowed the far right to co-opt portions of the opposition. The far right is in charge on the other side. You know, it's it's be, it's becoming almost sort of a Syria situation, like in terms of looking for like moral outcomes, right? Like mm. it's like, ah. Mm. Yeah. Or, or, or if you don't mind, I want to ask you if you could connect the dots for people who are listening with the the far right, the global reactionary movement, and um, what's happening in Ukraine, um, because it it seems to me that there would be. Um, more of a direct connection with that pan reactionary, that that global cabal. I hate to use that word, but it is. They're yeah, yeah, they're yeah. squatting up on a on a on a global level. How does this fit into that paradigm? Right. So, sort of the illiberal democracy, right, which Orban brilliantly has sort of branded what he's doing in Hungary. But this sort of bubble of illiberal democracy inside of Europe finds itself in natural ally with Putin ship, but. Uh, with Putin ship, no, <laughs> whatever Putin ship stands for, with Putin, right? It, right. it, it it's like it, there's a natural ally there, but it's sort of one-sided friendship. Mm. You know, it's like you you have a large regional power and a somewhat international power in Russia who looks for trouble and can support these things, but it they don't actually hold the same ideology necessarily. They don't have ideology. Right. Like the reason th th that's why it's so hard to like mm. this Ukraine thing and why it's so unfortunate we're sending pistols to fight missiles, as you saw in the clip, it is because we it's because Putin is just basing this on. Is this going to cost my country more than I want to do this? Right. Like mm. I want to do this. I want the power. I, You know, I want to show what I can do. I'd like to conquer something. Nobody gets to conquer anything anymore. Mm. Maybe I'll get to conquer something. That's exciting. I've done everything wow. else. Uh 
And so it's like it, it, it's so looking for sort of an ideological reasoning of it is why he and Lavrov laugh their way through all these meetings they have, because their objective is just to get the next piece of the puzzle in place to do the things that they want. Uh, and so they have this sort of network of anyone who finds themselves in opposition to whatever, you know, you might call kind of the establishment consensus, you know, on Earth finds a friend, a natural friend there. Yeah. and uh, and reciprocates. But what's interesting and confusing and just makes the situation, you know, morally more murky and richer is that the traditional far right used to really organize in Ukraine. And this is why you have a lot of disagreement and people getting fights on Twitter and they're like, no, you know, the Ukrainians are the real Nazis. And it's like, we don't actually have to like figure out who's the closest to the Nazis. If you play that game in Germany, the AFD, who's the far right party right. are like, four steps away uh, and the liberal party who are one of the ones in power are only one step away. Yikes. Mm. So it's sort of a silly game to be like, how many Google hits till I get to the Nazis? Do I want to like throw you in? There is, I think people who are in the small sense of like the letters in the world, illiberal and liberal, you know, cosmopolitan and a cosmopolitan uh, tolerant and intolerant. Uh, and it's sort of more primal than our traditional left, right spectrum. That's right gives us room for which right at the end of the day is just the mean girl seating chart from the French Revolution why we still use this thing is sometimes beyond me David pulled up this clip Putin is unlikely to invade Ukraine despite over overheated US rhetoric says Nina Khrushcheva let's play this clip because yeah I'm not sure that I'm convinced by that let's get to that in a second because this is very confusing for the US audience because you're getting one layer of of frankly propaganda and it that's okay it doesn't mean it's bad it, it's just propaganda no matter what whoever's whoever's throwing the propaganda out is throwing out the propaganda but i think it's hard for folks who are not in these universes to understand what's real to believe and and i'll ask you a question related to that. let's play the clip for more we're joined in moscow by nina kushcheva professor of international affairs at the new school co-author of in putin's putin's footsteps searching for the soul of an empire across russia's 11 time zones she's also the author of the lost khrushchev journey into the gulag of the russian mind she's the great granddaughter of the former soviet premier nikita khrushchev as for uh, ukraine it is a little bit of a complicated story because um, it's very unclear exactly what the uh, the Russian idea is to have all these troops on the border with Ukraine. Um, I am not of a school of thought that is especially, I mean, I know that is prevalent in the United States that Putin is going to invade Ukraine. Um, I think it is a bit of an information attack, if, mm. as the United States kept, kept saying, especially that all the media and quoting mm -hmm. Blinken and quoting Victoria Nuland, who is responsible for Russia and Eurasia, saying that, um, you know, if and so, and we think that they will invade and therefore we'll punish them in this very severe manners. Russians are keeping the troops, from my point of view, um, as they say, uh, to prevent uh, potential uh, Ukraine encouraged, uh, uh, Ukraine government encouraged by the West and uh, the Western military support from trying to take um, the territories annexed in 2014 by force. And I'm actually uh, tending to uh, trust Putin on that because I don't think he wants a, a, a large bloodshed. I don't think he wants to take Kiev, as many analysts have been, American analysts have been. Suggesting. All right, she backtracked that seriously there at the end. Hardcore, hardcore. Where it was like, they don't want to invade, then all of a sudden they're not going to take Kiev. I agree with her. I don't think they want to run the flag up Kiev. Kiev is close. They have a lot of troops there. It's scary. And you force the enemy to have to protect Kiev to some degree, their main capital city. You know, <laughs> huge amount of peoples live there. So that they don't have as much trouble for whatever they want to do. What they want to do is create a stable country. They have this whole new portion, Crimea. They took it. It went great. Why not? It's just... Here. I'm going to say, I don't know. This is going to sound sort of knee jerk and weird. Maybe it's just not a time for experts. It's a time for Imagineers, right? Like uh, you have someone who's obviously done this a long time. She's very smart, but she is locked in. It's always yeah. been like this and it's never been like this. No, no, this when is quite exactly literally, we just saw him take territory from Ukraine with very little effort, very little pushback. Yeah. And why wouldn't she go the rest of the way? Okay. So I'm so glad you say this because this is exactly what I wanted to lead into, which is I feel like in the U.S. and you're American, you get this. 
there's there's two trains of thought. On one hand, you have the establishment, Democrats in particular, but establishment Republicans too, but let's talk about the Democrats, who are like Russia, 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 Russia. But they're so out of touch with their own people and concerned about like suffocating the working class and staying in power through those means that they don't understand that's what's keep that's creating the openings for the right to empower essentially Russian interests, whether or not they're in bed with them or not is a whole other story. Simultaneously, you have the left who's so f- effing uh, concerned about the establishment Democrats that there's no way they want to, much of the left doesn't even want to take into to account what's actually happening in the real ge- geopolitical world. And so you have this conundrum here in the States in which we shouldn't trust the establishment for winning, let's say, but they, there is some truth to what's actually happening on the ground. But because of it, it's, it's like- crying wolf. I mean, I think we are, we are on the same, we are both towards the center of this argument, but on opposite sides somewhat, you know, like not opposite sides, but like I'm, I'm a Russiagate skeptic. Like I think they did some influence, but like, what are you going to do? Like no more than any other country does to any other country uh, in some oh, oh, ways. Is, but this saying every country, that, but it happened. Oh yeah, yeah. But, uh, but it's the same thing with like NSA and stuff. It's like, ah, you need to, now every country does it. Does it matter? It's like, yeah, it still matters. I don't know. Um, but no, but the, the point I was trying to make though, is that, is that, there is an accountability on either side in, in the media sphere. And that I think this is this is the problem. And so I think we find ourselves, even if we're looking and have different agreements on here, on the inside of where the media have kind of bracketed this thing. Mm-hmm. And, and and there has been no sort of apology um, for the the misinformation, frankly, around, you know, from Rachel Maddow's and people like that around how these things were happening. And there's also been no accountability for the actual actions. Uh, that a lot of the worst actors in the world right. do on a very regular basis. And it's a problem on both sides and people are really entrenched and they will not have the conversation uh, in the middle because this is one of those situations in which there is something happening in the middle. And she, uh, in this clip, you know, was so quick to sort of be like, all Americans think this. And like, I'm like you know, as someone who has so many reservations about the narrative that was told, uh, no, I'm here to say, just as a geopolitical observer, that I think they're going in. I think they're going in. I mean, and, and and then what happens? I mean, if 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 they go in, obviously it's about oil and ga- gas. But like, then what? Nothing. Uh, then they have a stable water supply uh, in the Crimea and some things that they want. No, but then nothing. And the consequence of nothing happening is just a further degradation or acceleration, if you're excited about it, or whatever it is, of currently the tangled but very fragile web that holds the world together. You know, there will only be so many times that the United States and Europe can make pledges for people and not show up. You know, we were all Georgians. John McCain used to be the one who said we were all people. Then it was Joe Biden. Don't forget that was his job in the Senate. We are all who we are all there. We're all Afghans. We're all, you know, and we haven't shown up for people. We are just bailing and we have to have a new recognition of what the world will look like when that continues. And when people no longer trust us necessarily to control the sea lanes, et cetera. You know, uh, um, Noam Chomsky and uh, PJ Prashad and some other people are working on a book right now, I think, about kind of the withdrawal, uh, you know, kind of American withdrawal from different places, whether it be Libya, whether it be all the, you know, everywhere, places that, you know, we're both familiar with. Uh, I think it's interesting. I think there's enough. To, there's it's enough going on that we can actually examine it critically. We used you know, to be I think inside the fish tank. This is my. I mean, people, the 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 Russian uh, whatever propaganda folks, <laughs> whoever's like the Syria propaganda universe that's out there, um, hit me on Libya all the time because my work there. But the the predominant work that I did there was was post Gaddafi collapse and specifically working on. With, with women who wanted to run for office and were writing the constitution, whatever. And it was, but, but the biggest frustration that we had was, okay, so NATO uh, bombed Libya and then did nothing. And then you had a bunch of weapons. And you, you can actually see what happens in the Literally. absence, right? In I, the vacuum. This, and this yeah. is exactly, this 